Welcome to this IUN Community Garden Session, Spring Tips from the Garden Center. My name is Amanda. I am the Assistant Director of the Center for Urban and Regional Excellence, and I will be tonight's moderator. Our presenter is Lynn Barbie. Lynn is a horticulturalist and master gardener and has worked in the retail garden industry for over 25 years, 22 years at the South Lake Home Depot. She loves helping people grow things. Landscape design is her favorite topic, especially woody plants and flowering shrubs. She's a big fan of foliage and is always looking for four season interests in the garden. She teaches business classes at, at Ivy Tech, and so with two jobs, she is always on the lookout for an easier way to do things in the garden. Welcome, Lynn. We are very glad to have you with us tonight. Thank you, thank you, and I thank you so much for coming tonight. So this is going to be a random, kind of random, maybe mishmash of all the different things that I get questions about a lot. Some of these I've, I've answered these questions, some of them for many, many times over through the years. But first I wanna note the picture on the front. This is a collection of heuchera, which you might've heard the term uh, coral bells because they're of, of a full perennial that has little tiny red bell-like flowers, but there are newer, newer varieties and I love the foliage colors on those. Like I said, I like foliage. Okay, first thing I want to say is, yes, you can plant things early in the spring. There are a lot of flowers and perennials that can handle colder weather. Not, not today, probably, but uh, pansies are one of the first things that comes to mind. Uh, you'll see those in garden centers in the fall, but also in, in the spring. I planted them years ago. I worked at the Mansard Apartments in Griffith. I planted them and had snow on them the following week, and they survived. Um, the flowers had, were a little damaged, but uh, the flower, the plants themselves were perfectly fine. Um, up here, oh, let's go to the next screen. Um, so prim primroses, or we sometimes call primula, uh, that's the, the official name for it. Dusty Miller, which are, um, well, Dusty Miller's back up in here in this uh, planter on the right, that gray foliage right there, foliage plant again. This, that planter was at my church, and last year for Easter, there was very little to be found in garden centers because Easter was April 4th, I think, very early. Um, but we were able to come up with something here, and the, the branches from a friend's from a friend's shrubs kind of filled in for, for some height. This is a, uh, on the right, is a contorted filbert. So later on, we'll talk a little bit about designing pots. And it's good, just like, I would say, it's like in a family photo, you usually have dad standing up, mom's a little shorter usually, not always, but you have kind of the photographers look for that triangular presentation. And you try to do the same thing with pots. Um, Creeping Jenny, like down here on the, the lower left picture, that uh, that's a perennial that hangs down there. Um, and that can handle very cold weather too. Pansies are probably the most common in Snapdragons. So yeah, here, landscaping in a pot. This is a proven winner's uh, photo, but when you're looking to plant something in a pot, you look for something tall here. Those are the thrillers. Uh, the fillers are the things that kind of just stay, you know, um, toward the, uh, they don't droop too much, but they will spill a little bit. And spillers are the things like sweet potato vine um, that are used. And a lot of times they'll, they'll call them accent plants and they'll all be lumped together there. Oh, uh, one question I see a lot, I talk a lot of people out of buying things. I'll tell you more about that later too. It'll come up again. Um, if you're planting in a container, don't buy garden soil, even and don't buy topsoil, even though it's cheap. It sounds like a good idea because it's so cheap. Um, but there is no aeration in pots. Like in the ground, you would have earthworms moving around, causing aeration for the roots of plants. In a pot, you do not have that. So uh, potting soil or uh, it might be called potting mix because there's no soil in it at all. It's a mixture of sphagnum moss, uh, peat moss, um, sometimes coconut fiber, maybe perlite and vermiculite. And it's lightweight stuff in there to keep it, um, the sphagnum moss keeps it from drying out too because a container, uh, anything above ground is going to dry out a little faster. Um, so those things keep moisture in there and, um, and, and that also helps with the aeration. Uh, so garden soil for in the ground and the bags will help you because the bags will tell you what's on there. And just, I forgot to put this in here, but have you ever had a pot or a hanging basket that has gotten so dry that when you water over it, the water just goes right over the top and doesn't actually get soaked up? 
uh, that's called um, the plant being hydrophobic. It's like it's afraid of water or it resists water. And that's because once peat moss and sphagnum peat get so, um, when they get so dry, you have to pretty much take that hanging basket down, soak it for, you know, even an hour or so till the soil ball has a chance to get all that water back in it again. And then don't let it dry out. You really need to water something in a pot or especially in a hanging basket almost every day. This term up here, hugel culture, I don't know if you've done anything with that um, at your garden, uh, at the IUN community, community garden, but hugel culture is a whole topic in and of itself. And I know somebody who could do a really good job for you talking about that. But um, it's a German method of doing a raised bed where you put big logs on the bottom and smaller branches and logs on top and have soil near the top and the logs hold moisture in. It's a easy way to make a raised bed, but this is an adapted form inside a pot. So you take big chunks of wood at the bottom because when you have a container, like that tall container I showed you from my church, that is, I forget what that is, three feet tall maybe, and the roots of a plant are only going to go maybe 12 inches, maybe 15 for most plants and uh, for, for most annuals anyway, uh, that are going to go in a pot. And so you want to use something maybe just to save money, you could put something at the bottom. Some people put bricks in there just for weight. Um, you could use styrofoam, um, pop cans, milk bottles or whatever. But if you put chunks of wood in like the bottom, at the bottom like that, that actually holds moisture in and releases moisture to your plants. Pop cans and milk jugs don't do that. Okay, all right. Uh, you uh, probably have noticed on a bag of fertilizer, a bag of lawn fertilizer or whatever, you'll see three numbers with dashes between them. It'll say 5, 10, 15, or you know, whatever. Those numbers uh, are the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that are in a, a bag of fertilizer. We call it NPK. Um, so we'll go back up here, N for nitrogen, P, P for phosphorus, it's a mouthful, and K, I suppose because P was already taken. If you've taken, uh, taken chemistry in high school uh, or college, you, would, you will recognize that. But for most people, it's like, why K? Uh, why would they use it a K? But NPK, and so each one of those nutrients, these are the three major nutrients that are far more needed for plants, but those are the major ones. So when you see, um, like in a product like here, the miracle Grow, and I'm only using miracle Grow because I was able to get five different ones right here like that. Um, miracle Grow is 24, 8, 16. So that's 24% nitrogen, 8% phosphorus, and 16% of the potassium, you'll notice that that bloom booster, because um, it, it'll have a high middle number, uh, not so much as it used to. And I think because phosphorus, phosphorus has gotten kind of a bad rap for being bad for the um, environment, especially for water. I have a question for you here. So uh, just think for yourself, if you were buying a bag of lawn fertilizer, which number do you suppose would be the highest? Um, well, I will tell you, I should have said unmute your phone, microphones, but nitrogen, because it is for green growth, green top growth, is be the highest amount. A bag of fertilizer will often have like 35%, 32% nitrogen. If you live in a um, place where you're not allowed to have phosphorus, the middle number might be zero, but it's always a lower number because you're not so concerned about fruit and flowers, right? When you're planting grass or when you're growing grass. The potassium um, is for all around growth and also um, for, for deep roots. So plants that, um, if, you're, if you're fertilizing for the winter or like in the fall, sometimes there'll be more potassium there because it's kind of like a bear hibernating for the winter. It takes all this nutrition down into the root zone. You don't need so much nitrogen in the fall. If you look on a bag of fertilizer, it'll have less nitrogen in the fall mix. Uh, and maybe it'll have more potassium. I don't mean more, more than it does nitrogen, but percentage wise. Um, but this is interesting. I mentioned the bloom booster used to be, and my, my uh, uh, what do you call it, is hidden right here. I can't see it. 
I'm not going to mess with it now. Uh, 1530, 15, I think it now took 52 in the middle. And, um, and that's because the bloom booster is looking for more of that phosphorus for flowers. I'll also mention that if you fertilize too often, sometimes you can get too much nitrogen on a plant at the expense of flowers. So if you have a, a perennial vine, maybe a clematis or something, you say it's not blooming. One possibility is because it could be because you're putting too much nitrogen on it by fertilizing too often. Now, I'm not gonna talk about all of these, but one thing I wanna mention, uh, the tomato fertilizer, like I said, all these have different things added to them because NPK is the three major nutrients, but there are other things. So sometimes for tomatoes, uh, it'll have extra calcium. Uh, but tomatoes need calcium to avoid the blossom and rot that you'll see sometimes turning the bottom of a tomato plant, a tomato black. But usually what the problem is for blossom end rot is usually caused by the inconsistent watering. And so even though there is enough calcium in the soil, the plant can't take it up because of inconsistent watering. But they still put calcium, extra calcium in tomato plant food, for example. Uh, that one in the lower right is specifically for acid-loving plants like azaleas, camellias, rhododendrons. Um, yeah, okay. So a real quick thing. Now, some of you might recognize these colors. I don't want to endorse any products in particular, but a lot of the uh, companies that sell lawn fertilizer have a four-step four step program, and you'll recognize those colors. Uh, the first one has a pre-emergent for crabgrass, second one broadleaf weed control, then insect control and fertilizer. Do you have to fertilize your lawn four times a year? No. Actually, the best time to fertilize your lawn is in the fall. Uh, again, like a bear hibernating for the winter, it will take all of that nutrient down into the root zone, making a better, stronger plant. But um, companies know that people want their lawn to get green in the spring, so they'll sell you fertilizer in the spring, and that I guess it does help your lawn turn green faster. But they also want to sell you, am I saying all this out loud? They also want to sell you more fertilizer. And so they have planned it. So you've got four steps with something added to each step. Um, the first step, which, by the way, easy way to remember when to apply these, you need to put at least, if, if you're going to use all four, you need to have at least six weeks between each step. So one way to remember it, um, although it changes from year to year, depending on weather, uh, first step, Easter, second step, Memorial Day, third day, 4th of July, or third one, 4th of July, and fourth one, Labor Day, four major holidays. And um, the bags are usually color-coded, no matter what brand it is, they seem to adopt the same colors. And um, so people often use that first step, like I said, early, early in the spring, because it's actually has, not only lawn fertilizer in it, these are all fertilizers, all lawn food, but that first one has something in it to prevent crabgrass. Uh, crabgrass, let's see, do I have this picture? No. Crabgrass, oh, I see a picture right here. Crabgrass is an annual. It will die at the end of the year. So if you have crabgrass in the fall, there's nothing you could do about it really um, because there are no chemicals or anything that you could spray on crabgrass that won't kill the other grasses that your lawn grass in particular. Um, so just wait till spring and put the pre-emergent on it. In that case, I would say, yeah, go ahead. If you can't get a pre-emergent by itself, go ahead and use the fertilizer in the spring. Uh, the second step that you would use when the weather's warmer, and that is better when the temperatures are warm enough that the bear is waking up from hibernation. I like that analogy, I keep using it. Um, but when the, the lawn is starting to wake up in the spring, the, uh, the, the weeds are starting to wake up in the spring and they're hungry. I keep using that analogy. Um, anyway, they will take the, you, you sprinkle the, the lawn fertilizer on it and the weed control has to stick to the leaves and it goes down into the root zone and kills the entire root then. I'd say if you're gonna skip anything, um, if you're, you know, even if you just wanna skip one, that summer one with the insect control in it for two reasons. One is that usually in the uh, in July or so, your lawn starts to kind of slow down and grows dormant because it's so hot. But the other thing is there's no reason to put insect control down if you don't know you have insects in your lawn. 
And, um, you know, you might see some, but there's no damage. There's nothing wrong. It's part of our, uh, it's part of the environment to have insects in your lawn, not a big deal. Okay, I hope I didn't confuse you too much, but basically there are two kinds of weeds. There are grassy weeds and broadleaf weeds. Grassy weeds look like grass and broadleaf weeds don't. And um, so I'll often have somebody come to me in the garden department and say, what is this weed? I don't know what this is and how do I get rid of it? And the bottom line is, does it look like a grass or is it, does it have broad leaves? It doesn't matter if you know what it's called. Sometimes I don't know what they're called and I'm not so concerned about that. Um, but you, there are products that will kill grassy weeds only. There are products that will kill broadleaf weeds only. And then there are products that will kill everything. Um, and we'll come across, we'll talk about those again too. Weed block. I don't know how many of you have had experience with using weed block or weed fabric. Um, if you want to use weed block or weed fabric, in most cases, uh, this is what will happen after a few years. It works for a while, but then eventually the, uh, the freezing of the ground, the thawing of the ground um, eventually just causes, uh, causes this. <laughs> so yeah, it'll work for a while. Um, and when you put mulch on top of it, the mulch becomes, becomes a nice decomposed, beautiful, rich layer of soil. And then the birds have this way of planting things on top of it. And then you just get a bunch of weeds. Um, now they won't go too, too deep because the, the fabric is there. But I actually found a spot a couple of years ago. I've lived in my house over 30 years. And last summer, I came across a piece of landscaping fabric in an area that I haven't touched in years. And I'm thinking, has that been there all these years? Was it there before I moved in? I don't know. Um, but the earthworms will be doing their thing underground, underneath that landscaping fabric. And uh, so my recommendation though here, first we'll talk about chemicals. Use chemicals very sparingly. Like I said, there's no need to spray um, for insects if you don't have any. I see customers coming in often to buy GrubX in the fall and GrubX does not work in the fall. The active ingredient in GrubX is intended to be used on grubs in the spring. So like I said, I talk people out of buying money, uh, buying things and saving money quite often in cases like that. And unfortunately, sometimes you'll see GrubX in a prominent place uh, when it's out of season. Um, so you wanna be careful that you're using things. When I was the, uh, my doing my Purdue Master Gardener training years ago, I learned the term, the judicious use of chemicals. Use good judgment. To, when I still use Roundup occasionally. I don't use much because I try to make my landscaping so that I don't need to do a lot of uh, weeding. Um, but Roundup, uh, in most cases, the real problem is people using too much of it. They're using it in, uh, in fields, in farm fields. You know, you see the pictures of them walking right into it. If you're being careful with it at home um, and you, you, know, you don't have problems with it, I think that'd be fine. Okay, this is my beautiful backyard and I told my friends on Facebook this week, um, do you think I'm gonna show them what it looks like at any other time? This looks beautiful right now. And uh, that's a William Baffin rose, a rose climber that's hardy into Canada. I planted it way too close to the garage because that's probably been there 25 years and I didn't quite know what I was doing then. Um, this is what it looked like the summer. I forgot to put a pre-emergent on there. So I mentioned spraying weeds. There are weeds, things that you could spray to kill broadleaf weeds or just grass um, or like something like that's a non-selective, it'll kill anything. But my preferred method is to prevent weeds. You could prevent weeds by planting things close together. Um, you can also prevent things by putting something down like a, what it's called a pre-emergent. And actually I should have put this in the order. This is, this is what the most common, commonly known product is. There's a product called Weed Stop as well. But just remember, all it does is prevent and it, all it does is prevent the growth of seeds. So when my daughter was six years old and she planted grass seed in my garden, <laughs> sprinkled it all over, uh, the, the, the pre-emergent would help with that. Um, but remember, it doesn't kill anything. So if you pull up all your weeds 
and leave the roots behind, they're going to come back and pre or pre-emergent will not do anything about that. But yeah, I use uh, preen every year and this is the spot I forgot to use it. And on the right is what happened after I pulled it out. Now they were annual weeds because that's what the birds usually give us. And that's what's in the soil from the year before because um, flowers do leave seeds behind. Um, and so the pre-emergent will prevent them from germinating. I have a brandywine viburnum that is now in that empty spot to fill in some space. Okay, so yeah, always look, it's um, in my business classes, we call it the utility of place. Things will be in the proper place when they need to be sold so that people could see them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more off the record too. <laughs> um, that's, that's my grandson. Look at that. How did that come in there? Let's talk about edging a little bit. My son and his wife bought a, their first home last winter, moved in three days before Christmas. And this is the edging that is circling all of the flower beds and planting areas, uh, including around this tree. And you can see how that is popped up. And, uh, pieces of it lying around like that too. Um, that, to the tree roots, um, obviously that tree has outgrown the edging. And uh, I see this a lot too. And I did the math. Uh, let's say that's a 10 foot circle. There's probably 35 bricks in a layer. So we're talking, you know, a few hundred dollars there in bricks and supplies. And as that tree grows up, the root flare, the part that goes like this, that, that's going to get bigger. And, um, and the, the, you've seen this before, I'm sure those bricks start to fall over like that. And um, so edging doesn't work like we, like we like to think it will. Uh, there are some types of edging that will lay flat on the ground um, and get um, nailed in, you might say. That might be better. I, I have not had any experience with that one. Um, but when you have something like this, uh, you know, it's just going to need a lot of upkeep. And also, it's, you're going to have to get, get a trimmer around and mow up around it, too. Um, several years ago, a landscaper suggested this to me, which I have used in my yard since. It's called a dug edge. You could probably go to YouTube. I think there is actually a video that calls how to install a dug edge, because that's actually the name for it. And you're going to have to dig something like that with a spade anyway to put the edging in. Um, so that one, you just dig it up like that, put some mulch in there, and then... Uh, lay the mulch all the way across the top and have it fill in that little trough too. Um, that is where I will go around with um, Roundup. Um, now that's not my house, I wish it was, no. Uh, that's just a beautiful picture of a landscape with a dug edge and it's easy to mow around as well. Now that's where I will go around periodically and uh, you know, clean up or use Roundup on there before I put new mulch down. I don't know about you, but I don't put mulch down every year. It's partly it's an expense thing. I just don't want to spend the money on there. So this this one is not my yard. This one is. <laughs> um, I had a patio back there, and my house was built in the forties. I had a patio back there that was starting to fall apart, and I had that removed a couple years ago. And this is one season's worth of weeds. Um, I don't remember if I had the patio taken out early in the spring or what, if this is the same summer or if this is the following spring, I don't know. But if you wanna kill everything, you're gonna look for a non-selective herbicide. Non-selective means it's not picking out anything, it's not selecting anything, it's just killing it all. Glyphosate Roundup is probably the most common one. There are some that are called extended control and I would be a little more cautious around those. You could use, um, some of those you could use even around the roots of a tree to make a tree ring, but some of them are the extended control ones will uh, migrate through the soil into other places. Roundup stays put. You spray Roundup on a plant, it goes into the root zone and does not move. Some of those extended control herbicides will go down into the, um, into the ground. Uh, that's the only way it sterilizes the soil then. That's why it, can't, why it has an extended control. And then again, use good judgment, read the label, make sure you're looking for what you want to do. Okay, so you know what I did with this here? I, um, I think I did spray some Roundup on there. I got most of the uh, stuff out that I knew was annual, but just to be safe. And then I wet the ground really, really good. I think I waited till after a really good rain and then put sheets of cardboard down, wet that really good and then put mulch on there. So you can see on that picture on the far right, that's what it looked like 
when I was done. That was the first step I had to fit. Obviously, I didn't do what's at the left. Uh, but cardboard is a really good um, weed block. It's also temporary, but at least it does something else to the soil. Um, okay. A very common question, will this come back next year? And I saw that somebody had asked about pansies. Pansies are, um, I did actually see that question. Uh, pansies are an annual in our area, um, but they are just very cold tolerant. And like I said, anything in a pot is gonna get colder than it would be in the ground. Um, so they're not quite like violas or in, they're in the same family though. So perennials do come back every year, annuals do not. I wish I could remember, think of an easy way to remember it because annuals, I think like, well, like annuals like taxes, you have to do them every year or annual like taxes, they come back every year or I don't know. But anyway, the perennials will come back every year. Uh, you have to look at what zone, we're in zone five and uh, I've got a map of that here in a little bit. But because they come back every year, they only bloom for a short time. Perennials will bloom for the most part, three weeks, four weeks. So like this purple cone, or this, it's, it's a variety of coneflower. It's not purple, obviously. This is Cheyenne spirit coneflower on the left, uh, a newer variety that comes in all those pretty colors. Um, if you were to go to a garden center right now, you probably would not find it um, because there's nothing to look at. It's just leaves. Um, but it'll bloom in the fall for a few weeks. So if you want something in a pot, for example, that's why most people pick annuals. And annuals will come, will not come back every year, but they bloom all summer long. And that's why people put annuals in pots because you're only gonna use it for the season and you want that to have color all, all year long. Um, I say it, it's kind of like the sex education part of a plant because um, a plant's, a flower's purpose is to set seed. So if the annual knows it's only gonna live one year, it has to set lots of seed and it gives you lots of flowers. That's a type of impatience on the right, by the way. Uh, I mentioned I'm a big foliage fan. These are a few pictures of beautiful containers with mostly foliage. And there's, there's some heuchera, that purple right there is a heuchera. And we see coleus and a few pops of color here and there. I just love foliage. And I think like even in a landscape, you try to have, or at least it, I suggest that you do, look for different varieties of shrubs and um, things that have, especially the newer plants have beautiful foliage colors, um, like the heuchera right there that used to be just a green plant and the hybridizers, uh, the breeders are making them um, with all different colored foliage. So even though you don't see flowers on those and the flowers on these plants are not much to speak of anyway, uh, they're grown mostly for the foliage. All right, spring bulbs. Um, you might be wanting to have some spring bulbs at, at your house. Those are actually planted in the fall. Um, bulbs, uh, the, the tulips and daffodils anyway, uh, need to have a, at least six weeks co of cold vernalization. They need to have a cold spell before they will bloom. Uh, so that's why some places where the weather never gets cold enough, they can't grow them or they will grow them. They might have a way of chilling them or something ahead of time. Um, but you get a better selection on bulbs if you'll plant them, if you'll look for them in the fall. Now, you can buy bulbs like this. These are already grown. Um, a nursery has put maybe one bulb in every pot and um, kept them chilled potted them up and then come to the nurseries when they are just about ready to bloom. And, um, but look at that, we're talking $2.48 for one cup. So it's a lot cheaper if you do it in the fall um, and also a far better selection, far better selection. But there are some bulbs and tubers and corms, they're all, made, they're all a little different uh, that you can buy in the spring. And those are for, most of them are for summer blooming flowers only. That stargazer lily in the bottom is a dormant plant. You'll, you'll find those, like when you go to the nurseries, you'll see all these bagged um, bulbs. The, the dahlia bulbs, top right is a dahlia, bottom right gladiolas, and then the far left cannas. Those are all dormant plants and roots, and you'll see them all together in the garden center, but there will be a few perennials tossed in there or hardy plants, we would say, like that stargazer li lily in the middle. 
So always read the label. Now the, the dahlias, gladiolas, and cannas, you can plant. You, the, those, the bulbs are, and the roots are available now in garden centers. You can plant them when the weather gets a little warmer. And then in the fall, you'd have to dig them up. And then you can save them as long as you save them in the right place without letting them get rotted or anything. They're kind of like storing onions. You've got to take care of them the same way. And uh, then you can plant them again in the spring and they will multiply in the meantime. Okay, seed package. If you look at the back of the seed package, uh, you'll see all kinds of information, including how early to plant, if you're gonna plant it indoors. Like some people don't start looking for plant, uh, seeds in the garden center until you know maybe April or May. And then it's like, oh, so for some of those things, it's too late. This is um, a yellow to, uh, pear tomato, it says on here. Plant uh, six to eight weeks before planting outdoors. So in our area, you would normally plant things outdoor in Mother's Day. March. So yeah, this would be about the time to plant those things indoors if you want to. But one thing I want to call your attention to, if you could see up here where it says indeterminate, indeterminate. When it comes to tomatoes, uh, a lot of people don't realize this. There's two different types of tomatoes and the package or the tag will tell you or should tell you which it is. Um, an indeterminate tomato, like the picture shows, will usually is a vining type of tomato, it will grow to an indeterminate height and it will bear fruit over an indeterminate amount of time. In other words, all season long. So if you want tomatoes for salads, that's what you're looking for. The tomato on the right is a determinate tomato, sometimes called a bush tomato. Um, I don't know if those terms are exactly always the same. I don't know if it has to be a bush tomato to be determinate, I don't know. But if you were, if you like to can, which I don't, I've never canned anything, not tomatoes anyway. Um, but if you wanted to can tomatoes, that's probably more likely what you're looking for because all of your fruit will bear all around the same time over a short period of time. Another thing is if you have a neighbor who says, wow, look at my tomatoes are so big and you know, yours are so small. Well, it could be you have two different types of tomatoes. Even among varieties, you're gonna see a difference, okay? So keep an eye on that indeterminate and determinate thing. Do not plant your annuals too early. I've heard that actually the tomato, tomatoes and peppers especially, uh, both warm um, season plants, they like it really, really warm. If you plant it too early, it's really not gonna do much. If you wait until Memorial Day or Mother's Day at least, uh, the weather will be warmer and you'll catch up quickly um, any any time that you would have lost, you know, unless you're going to plant it with um, with something over the top of it to keep it warm, or plant it in a greenhouse or something. I actually checked. I'll go on my phone and and just uh, do just ask you know, ask Google what's the frost free date for uh, my zip code, you know, and I think that said I think it was uh, May fifth this year, or was it Mother's Day? One of the two. But yeah, and so that, that picture we're looking at here is frost damage on a tomato plant that, that went out too soon. Okay, we're in zone five. You can see the, the band of blue right there. That, uh, that zone it gives us the coldest temperature a plant will go down to. So if you were to buy like that rose bush that I bought, I never do anything to that rose bush. It's awesome. And it never has any dieback or anything. That is uh, William Baffin rose named after a Canadian explorer part of the Canadian Explorer series, and they're all really hardy up into Canada. So this here, this little bit of purple here that's close to Canada is zone three. If you were to buy a plant, um, uh, yeah, here, okay, look at this. It'll tell you this particular hydrangea is zones five to nine. If you wanted something that um, to make sure, or uh, like you, you were in a colder pocket and wanted, just didn't wanna take any chances, you could look for something that would say it was hardy to zone three. Or like uh, some of those, you know, I wonder, I think the Lysimachia that I mentioned in, that would drape over a, a planter, that might be a, a colder zone plant, uh, but then also keep in mind that things in containers don't have the buffering around them. So I still don't think that's gonna last over winter in a container. So there is the, that's the USDA um, map for hardiness. So like I said, it's important to know what zone we're in. Then you buy a dahlia thinking it's going to come back next year. 
And see that Nico blue hydrangea on the right? Hydrangeas are native to, well, I don't know if they're native to the South or they just do so much better in the South. I think they're native to China, maybe. There are some uh, native hydrangeas. But that particular Nico blue hydrangea was the only uh, macrophylla type hydrangea that you could buy in garden centers years ago. Um, but I had customers at the previous job I had before uh, Home Depot, customers would come in and say, um, I have this beautiful hydrangea, the foliage is it's big, it's beautiful, but it never gets any flowers. And the problem is that that plant is marginally hardy here. It will say zone five on the tag maybe, but in winter um, it dies back. And since it's a plant that grows on what we call old wood, it grows on wood that was grown the year before, when that those twigs die back, um, you've lost the chance for flowers that year. Now, um, and the purple fountain grass is just not even, whenever I see someone buying like six or seven or 10 of those, I ask them, do you know that that's not gonna make it till next year? And then they're putting them all back on the shelf. So I wanna sell stuff, but I want, <laughs> I want people to be happy with their sales. So this hydrangea on the very far right, you'll see that it is a Nico blue hydrangea. So it has that going against it. Um, but the other thing too is those hydrangeas that are sold like that, bare root hydrangeas sold in a box, those are dormant plants. Um, you have to keep an eye on them to make sure that, first of all, that it's a plant that will be hardy in our area, zone five or cold or better. Um, but you also wanna make sure it is a, uh, that it's not going bad because if it is kept in a nursery, garden center, big box store um, in an improper location, it could start to get soft. Um, and again, it's just like, um, just like the root, you know, the, we were talking about the tulips and things like that. They have to be firm and, um, and, and have to be kept in, in the right environment. So the hydrangeas, those are starting to leaf out already. And if you were to plant something and it, if, it, if it sits in a box like that too long and doesn't get planted, it's just not going to do well. Uh, but I want to point out that hydrangea on the left, that is an endless summer hydrangea, a newer variety. A lot of the breeders, again, are coming up with things that are stronger, more hardy, more color. They're all the sizes we want. It's just really interesting. I love seeing what they come up with every year. So that is just one type of macrophylla hydrangea that um, that will will bloom, not necessarily blue, because if you remember that um, fertilizer I showed you later earlier, the miracle Grow fertilizer for acid loving plants, if you don't have a location where your soil is naturally acidic, it's going to be really hard to keep it acidic enough to make your um, hydrangeas blue. And um, Amanda, this is where I said we, there's a, there is a um, Proven Winners has a wonderful website, Proven Winners, and they've got a um, like a, a chart where you have to figure out what kind of hydrangea you have and try to decide why it's not blooming. It's called Hydrangeas Demystified. And I think we were going to try to add that later in afterwards to send it to anybody who wants it. So, okay, so there's the, the directions. Always, it's like I tell my students, always read the instructions. Everything's there that you need. Um, the, also, the uh, Proven Winners has the chart that shows the diff six different families of hydrangeas because some of them that are especially the ones native to our country are not going, they'll be white and they'll never change any colors. It's those macrophylla ones that will. So, <laughs> shouldn't have to say this, but these azaleas and hydrangeas that you see in pictures that come in that beautiful little floral wrap it's in floral wrap, it's in a florist environment, in a greenhouse. Consider those as florist plants only, please. Um, they, are, they have not been grown outdoors or not grown outdoors in our area. And they are not intended necessarily, they are not intended to grow outdoors in our area. Um, I helped a customer last year, she was buying a, a hydrangea and I was a little concerned that foil wrap and I looked and sure enough, it said it was only hardy in zone six to nine. So you're, if, they, when, if they're grown like this, just think of them as florist plants, florist gifts. And, um, oh yeah, so as you go to the garden center, see here, don't limit yourself to a spring visit. Um, I think I mentioned the, the, about the breeders growing new things like the, the endless blue 
uh, or endless summer hydrangea in the middle. But on the left is a lilac, they call it bloomerang because it's, it blooms again. I don't know if I would say it blooms continuously. And sometimes when things, uh, when they say it's a repeat bloomer, the second time around doesn't necessarily bloom the same way. But lilac bushes, like because they're kind of like a, they're kind of like a perennial. Shrubs are like act like a perennials in that they only bloom once for a few weeks. And um, but this one will bloom again. And the other thing I want to mention that little my Monet Wygela, because breeders are coming up with things that are um, bloom longer, more disease resistant, but also in the sizes that we're looking for. So my Monet is a smaller Wygela. The traditional, I should say traditional, the original Wygela that everybody's familiar with, um, grows to like four to six feet tall, plain green foliage, beautiful little flowers in the spring like that. But then when it's done blooming, you just have a green plant. And uh, I wish I had a picture of the mock orange I have that is growing right next to a lilac. And when they're not in bloom, you think it's all one shrub. And there's no, there's no contrast. That's why I say in landscaping and designing containers, you want to look at contrast and different heights and foliage. Um, let's see that one, when it's done blooming, you have that beautiful variegated foliage and it's also in a smaller size. I think my Monet gets to maybe two feet tall. So don't just go to garden centers in the spring. Everybody does. But like I said, this beautiful plant right there, that's an autumn tree sedum. Uh, it is a perennial. It blooms for a few weeks in the fall. It is a succulent. So it's... Um, I always think it looks like pink broccoli or something, um, but it, because it's a succulent, it holds moisture, very easy to grow, uh, but you won't even see it in the spring usually because it's it flowers in the fall. And that is the end of my presentation. I see a lot of questions. And while I'm looking at questions, um, I'm going to um, mention that the phone number that's on the screen is for the Purdue Extension. There is a hotline that you can call if you have questions but also um, there's a Facebook page for Master Gardeners too. The first okay. question which you addressed earlier on in the presentation, but I just wanna make sure that the question was answered was the, do pansies last all summer or just in the spring? Because they like the cooler weather, they tend to kind of poop out, I guess you'd say in the middle of the summer, unless you have them in a cool spot, maybe in the shade a little bit, but yeah, they usually, um, like when I plant them in a, a in a public place, I, I'll be pulling them out because they just won't look good in the summer. Great, thank you. How do I keep my geraniums looking good all summer? I planted them in a contain in a container and they look good at first, but after the first flowers die, the rest of them don't come in as nice. What should I do to keep them blooming all summer besides putting in fertilizer? Um, yeah, I'm assuming you're cutting off the dead dead flowers right at the base because that's usually the first thing that'll cause that they'll stop blooming um with with any annuals this is a good time to mention this with any annuals and this might not be your problem but with any annuals because their job is to produce flowers um if if, if that plant thinks its job is done like you know geranium has that little starburst right thing and it's done its job seeding if, if you um, don't cut that off before it goes to seed, it think it's got to try again and it blooms new flowers. So, um, so you just want to make sure you deadhead, that's called deadheading for those of you who have not heard that before. Um, so, you, so you deadhead, um, and a, a, some, there are a lot of annuals that don't need that, like impatience don't need to be deadheaded. Um, petunias would have to be, and something like, um, like there are, what's the name of the petunia right now? Why did I think of it? There's a petunia, maybe somebody can remember it. The one that you don't have to um, prune. What's that name? I it escaped me now. But petunias will have a tendency to hang out of the basket or out of your container or spread on the ground. And eventually toward middle of the summer, it gets so leggy that it just doesn't look good anymore. And the stems don't have flowers on them anymore. And so at that point, it's a sign that you should, you know, give it a haircut. And if you've got it in a container, you can cut, you know, just give it a trim. Or I go through periodically, I don't do hanging baskets anymore. I don't have that kind of patience, but um, I'll go around periodically and, and pinch off 
or cut off um, one of those, you know, some of the stems to keep it blooming. And so that might be what it is, I, I don't know. But there are some, the newer petunias, the wave, that's what it was, the wave petunia, will grow to be about in one plant, you buy it in a four inch cup, and it's like three or $4, but one plant will grow three to four feet across and you don't have to do any deadheading on it. And that's why that costs more, but that's a newer thing. You don't have to pinch off dead flowers. Great, thanks, Lynn. How many hours a day do you consider full sun, partial sun, and shade? Okay, I think full sun is considered six hours a day. It's not as much as you would think. It's like um, six hours, and I think part sun, four to six hours. Again, those are kind of variable. It's, you know, unless you had a, well, even if you had a thing out there to measure your sun, it's still kind of vague because different plants like different things. But I think six hours is considered full sun. Looks like we do have one more question. What do you think about using a vinegar mix to kill weeds? I was, she was told to use that. You know, I've heard that too. I have not tried it. Um, I was, from what I understand, it has to be a really strong vinegar. You can't just use table vinegar for that. And there are some, I don't know if it's like 40% strength or something. Um, there for a while, we had a product that was supposed to be, um, it wasn't really a vinegar, but basically from what I understand, again, have only used this product that was similar. Um, when you spray the weeds, it, it turns white. It takes a lot longer for them to die, I think. And I think a lot of people are unhappy with that. They want it to work faster. Uh, it can't hurt anything, but like I said, it needs to be a strong, um, a stronger uh, percentage. And I would also say that you want to make sure, like if, if it was something in the in your driveway, you were trying to kill weeds, but I wouldn't want to put it um, like to kill weeds in my lawn because you're probably the damage the lawn in that circle as well. I mean, you've probably known people who have sprayed a dandelion in the middle of the grass with something like Roundup and they've got a big old circle of dead grass too. Um, so you just want to be careful. But like I said, it has to be a strong uh, percentage. Well, we thank you so much, Lynn, for sharing your knowledge with us, all of your um, you know, hard earned knowledge. And so we appreciate that. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thanks everybody.